Okay, so today we have Mr. John Perkins as the chief economist at a major international consulting firm. John Perkins advised the World Bank, United Nations, IMF, U.S. Treasury Department, Fortune 500 corporations, leaders of countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East, and the first edition of his Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Spent 73 weeks on the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list and has been translated into 32 languages. Now, that's no easy task, is it? Well, no. <laughs> why, did it, why was it so popular? Well, first of all, Jake, it's, what's most interesting here is it was rejected by 39 publishers, including the one that just has published your book, Penguin. Which later, which later paid a lot of money to buy the paperback rights from the from the one publisher that after thirty nine rejection, I get thirty nine rejection <laughs> letters. Can you imagine? I mean, that's that's touching a jaguar. Uh, and then finally, a small um, house that was on the verge of bankruptcy published it. Now they're doing extremely well, and Penguin eventually paid a lot of money for the paperback rights, which they could have gotten for next to nothing if, uh, originally. But anyway. I don't know. You know, I don't know how to how it got on the bestseller list. This small house bought it. I was on a couple of shows, and I think a pivotal one was Amy Goodman's uh, Democracy Now, which I was on in New York City for about ten minutes. And that afternoon, it it hit the uh, Amazon bestseller list, and then within a couple of days, went to the New York Times and stayed there. And it sold over two million copies now, and now it's up to thirty five languages. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's still going strong. So, you know, I did nothing to make that happen other than write the book and, and appear on some on some shows and it just it just took off. I don't think, you know, people have asked me, so what's the secret to publishing a bestseller? Do you have to buy a hundred thousand copies of your own? <laughs> and I, I there's no secret as far as I'm concerned. It just for me it just happened. So a lot of people have actually, you know, you I might say in passing to someone hypothetically, hey, oh, uh, yeah, tomorrow I'm interviewing this guy, John Perkins. Oh, I never heard of him. Oh, we wrote this book. It's called Confessions of an Economic Kit Man. And maybe they haven't read the book, but they say, oh, yeah, that sounds familiar. Why don't you give us a synopsis of what the book Confessions of an Economic Kit Man is about and, and if any, how it's relevant in today's uh, changing world? Yeah, and, and incidentally, Jake, I get that all the time. It's like I introduce myself and be like, oh, yeah, that's nice. And then people at some, some, at some point in the conversation will come up that I wrote confessions. Oh, my God. It just actually <laughs> happened last night. I was at a at a beach party. Uh, I was just, you know, four or five couples, and we were very practicing social distancing really well. <laughs> we had a bonfire, and there was one, a couple I, I'd never met before. And when I was introduced, they said, oh, yeah, that's nice. And then somehow it came up. The woman said, you're my hero. I can't believe it. And the, <laughs> husband said, yeah, you forced me to read that book, and I didn't know, but I liked it. So yeah, so it's funny how nobody knows my name, but they know the book, which is fine. That's fine with me. So an economic hitman, um, I think the, 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 the short version is that uh, my, my real title was chief economist at a major consulting firm, like you said earlier. I had a pretty large staff working for me, and, and our job, my job was to identify countries with resources our corporations covet, like oil and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sisters. But the money never actually went to the country. Instead, it went to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country, things like power plants and industrial parks and highways and ports. And they had to hire U.S. corporations to do that. So these U.S. corporations took Basically, the loans went directly to the U.S. corporation. never actually went to the country. The country signed off on the debt using their resources as a collateral. But the money went directly to an American corporation to build these projects. And these corporations made huge profits. Uh, and a few wealthy families in the country benefited tremendously because they owned the industries, they owned the commercial establishments, the shopping malls and the banks, things that benefited from this improved infrastructure. But the majority of the people suffered because money was diverted from health care, education, and other social services to pay the interest on the debt. And in the end, the principal could never be paid. So we'd go back, man, under the guise of the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and, 
and and strike a deal. We say, hey, we'll 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 help to adjust your debt, but there's some conditions. We call them conditionalities, and these were things like sell your oil or whatever the resource was real cheap to our corporations without any environmental or social regulations, or privatize your public sector businesses like your utility companies, your schools, and, and so on and so forth, and sell them to our investors real cheap, or let us build a military base on your soil, vote with us on the next United Nations vote against Cuba, things like that. And uh, so, you know, a few people were really benefiting, but the majority of the people were, were, were suffering. And incidentally, it, 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 presidents were caught in this difficult position that we were basically offering them, them and their cronies, because they own, you know, they own the industries for the most part. These were fairly well. These were the, the controlling families of most of these countries, and yeah, okay. Here's an opportunity for you and your family to benefit, or if you don't buy into this deal, remember what happened to Salvador Allende in, in Chile and in Arbenz and Guatemala and Lumumba in the Congo and and. And 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 Vietnam and Vietnam and Mossadegh in Iran. These were all heads of states that did not buy into these deals, and they were taken down by people we call the jackals, people who either overthrow governments or assassinate those their leaders. And every one of those heads of state that I mentioned was taken out by jackals. And two of my clients, ultimately, who who had integrity. Uh, the democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, and the head of state of Panama, Omar Torrijos, they did not buy into the deals, and they both went down in, in private plane crashes that were extremely suspicious. I have no question, and most people have no question, these were assassinations. So today, that's basically, <clears throat> right, so let's, right now, right, we have a, an economy that is, I mean, on the verge of of a total collapse. And one of the things that's keeping the dollar strong right now is, of course, that we've arranged these debts, these loans in all of these countries all over the world. So there's a huge demand for for dollars still. And it's making the, while the rest of the currencies are falling apart, the dollar is still held together. Is this because there was a lot of these it, does this have to do with the types of loans that um, the IMF and organizations such as the ones you were working for were doing, or, or how how is that coming into play with the with the strength of the dollar and the demand for dollars in a deflationary environment right now? Well, because I think yeah, it, 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 there's a lot of factors, but perhaps the, the strongest one is that. Uh, and part of all of this process of spreading, basically, what we what my job was was to spread a form of imperialism, uh, an empire. And it's, we can call it an American empire, but it's really a corporate empire that's backed by the American government and our military forces. We to support our, the big global corporations that mainly operate out of the United States for the most part. Uh, and, and so empire, one of the, there's several characteristics of an empire. <laughs> one of them is that your currency is the currency that's used globally which we, we, we've made it very obvious that that's the dollar. We've, we've made the dollar that that. And partly that's because uh, up, up until very recently, and, and including now still to, for the most part, you can only buy oil on the international market with dollars. And Saudi Arabia and OPEC have, have backed that for years. There's a long story behind that that I talk about in the book. I was involved in that process. Hmm. But in a second, so so the dollar is supreme because we've made it supreme, basically. And we've actually enforced that with the military if we've had to. So when, when heads of countries have decided to try to go on their own currency, as Saddam Hussein did, and uh, there have been several other... How leaders, about Gaddafi? Gaddafi of, of Libya also. Uh, we take them out. And, and there, there's usually a couple of other reasons. It's not just because okay. of the dollar, but it, that dollar certainly is a factor. Um, and in a second... You know, a characteristic of an empire is it's the dominant language in, in all commercial and, and diplomatic mm -hmm. activities, and that's that's English. And of course, the third one is it has the world's largest military by far, and, and we our military 
the spending, we, we spend more on our military budget than the next 10 countries combined, <laughs> which is outrageous, especially at a time when we also have the highest case of coronavirus, which that tells you something about our priorities as far as defending our people are concerned. Um, so, the, so there's these factors, and the dollar certainly is one of them, and we put that in this position of extreme importance in the world, and, and we, we, we try very hard to defend that. Today, China is emerging. No question about it. China's in the process of taking over as a the, as the world leader. It, it hasn't done it yet, but I'm seeing it more and more in places like Latin America and Africa, where China's influence is becoming stronger and stronger. And they're uh, very determined to make their own currency uh, equal, if not stronger, than the, the dollar. That hasn't happened yet, but it's it's in the works. Believe me, it's in the works because because their international banks are very very strong today and bigger than the World Bank and the, our, our banks. And they're buying, of course, incredible amounts of gold. The, yeah, they're buying gold, and then they're also buying huge amounts of all kinds of resources around the planet. Doing a similar strategy to what you were doing, where they go in and they offer a loan to, to poor countries with natural resources? Yes, yes, exactly. But th there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a major change, a major difference. And that is that it's up to now, at least, uh, they haven't sent in their militaries. They haven't assassinated or overthrown any heads of state, with the possible exception, with the exception of, of Tibet and, and we might say Hong Kong and, and their, 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 their attempts at Taiwan. So within their own immediate sphere of influence, this, this circle of countries that they've always, historically, there's been this claim that China's had those, they've done that, but they haven't done it. In Latin America, I talked to friends in Latin America in very high places. I was recently on a television interview with the former the president of Ecuador, um, and and you know they'll say, well, you know, China's not hasn't done these things. They haven't they haven't put a military base on our soil. You have. They haven't assassinated any of our presidents. You have. And will they do this in the future? Well, maybe, but they haven't yet. And so we we trust them a little more. They. Yeah, they're 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 imperialistic, but they're doing it all with trade. They're doing it all with money. The United States did it with money and debt, and also with military and CIA involvement, and and the tremendous amounts of diplomatic pressure. China hasn't done that yet. I, I think, as I, t I talked with a, one of <laughs> President Putin's advisors, I was in speaking at a big event in Saint Petersburg, Russia, not long ago, and I get to know his uh, one of his top. Uh, Economic advisors, I think his top economic advisor is Sergei Vashev. And, and Sergei, and we get along <laughs> very well. He'd written books similar to mine, actually, in a way, and he speaks excellent English. And he said, You know, I think the Chinese have learned from the mistakes that we Russians and, and you Americans have made around the world. We've been bullies, we've pushed people in many ways. They're being very, they're, they're being very crafty doing it almost entirely through trade which is historically the way China's done a lot of things for, for hundreds of years. So what are your predictions when you're, everything you know about the economy and all the types of people that you talk to and then seeing everything happening right now with the infinite QE infinity and the Fed balance sheet going straight up, the, the unemployment going through the roof, and all of these types of things happening in the world. What, it, what, is, what do you see and what are your predictions for how you see the, uh, glo the economy playing out, the, the, the dollar? Do you still see the dollar as a reserve currency down the road? Do you think that IMF is going to institute SDRs coming up here soon? What do you foresee happening? Well, I, I think... You know, I've been writing for a long time, and in, in my, my, my this new book, which I love, I love, I love to show the cover because I love this jaguar, <laughs> touching the jaguar. I talk extensively about how we've um, created, how I, people like me, and, and and many others created what economists today are often referring to as a death economy. It's an economic system that's consuming itself into extinction. It, it's destroying itself because it's driven by a single goal which is really a perception, and, and perceptions create reality. We can get into that more if you want. But the goal is to maximize short-term profits, regardless of the social and environmental cost. 
That's a pretty new and outrageous goal for human beings. Out of our 250,000 years, we've not had that kind of a selfish outlook on life for a long time. And we need to change that and move back to the kind of outlook we've had in the past for, for most of our history, which is creating a life economy, which is based on the idea that, that, that the goal, the perception, the goal is to create long-term benefits for people and nature. For, for everything, for future generations, to take care of future generations. And so a life economy, you know, consumes all of its its resources and it's in the short term. It doesn't worry about the long term, even a business that t totally depends on oil, for example, just outrageously consumes and consumes and consumes and doesn't really worry about the consequences of what it's doing to the environment, the long term consequences of how much oil it's using, what it's doing to the earth in the process. A life economy uh, pays people. And, and, and pays investors to invest in processes that clean up pollution, you know, that, that come up with techniques and, and uh, processes for, for mining all the plastic out in the oceans, <laughs> you know, and recycling it, for cleaning up all the gas and petroleum that's, that's spilled around every gas station in the world, essentially, and uh, every drilling site. And so to clean up pollution, to regenerate destroyed environments, to come up with better technologies for recycling, for using air and, and sun and, and everything, for wind, for using renewables to create energy, to, to come up with the businesses that do not sap the earth, that do not ravage the earth. We've been in the process of doing that, B corporations, conscious capitalism, the Green New Deal. There's been so many signs that people are getting this. We, we were in that process before the coronavirus. But I think this virus really has demonstrated to us how, how important all of this is. And, you know, everybody's seen, or most everybody's seen these pictures of, of how China, you know, the, the pollution vanished over China and, and people in Los Angeles and many other cities are saying, God, we can see the stars for the first time. You know? uh, so, uh, you know, I, I've, I've advocated for a long time that we must make this transition from a death economy it's based on short-term profits for basically a few individuals to, to a, a life economy that's based on long-term benefits for everyone and, and for all of nature, because what are we without nature? Uh, and I, and I, so my project, predict, pr pr prediction is that we are, we will move in that direction. Uh, we have to move in that direction one way or another, or we're going to vanish. Uh, we're going to go the way of the dinosaurs. Uh, the way of the Mayan civilization, for example, the, the ancient Mayan civilization, there's a, new, there's a new one that's emerged, but the ancient one with these huge cities that basically constructed itself into extinction. Um, so the, the writing is on the wall. We've got to change or we're going to meet with tremendous catastrophe. And we're going to change either gently, which I think the coronavirus is not gentle, but it's a lot gentler than it could be. Uh, you know, the numbers, 100,000 people in the United States, I think, was what, was what the recent, most recent number is, died of this. That's a lot. It's more than Korea and Vietnam combined. But it's still an awful lot less than what happened during the influence of 1918, <laughs> the Black Plague. So it's relatively gentle compared to what we might get if we don't change. So I think we're, we're presented with this opportunity to really look and listen and say, hey, we've got to change the way that we uh, conduct our, our existence on this planet. Yeah, my concern is looking at, you know, unemployment numbers, which obviously they, they lie on the unemployment numbers when the, when the Fed or the Treasury released that. They said it was at 15 um, it's probably already closer to 20. Even Jerome Powell, chairman of the Fed, said that he's estimating this to be somewhere in 20 to 30 percent by the end of June for unemployment. Then, you know, you look at the graphs of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet going straight up. And we look at the fact that, you know, there are, like you said earlier, you said these really aren't, this isn't it's kind of an American imperialism, 
but it's much more than that. These are international corporations that control the monetary system of the whole world. And they really have their origins in Europe, not America. And this is a very centralized uh, group of individuals and, and, and families. And they are giving every indication they're going to literally continue to press the enter key on their computers to print infinite money as long as possible. And my concern is with the rise of, of robots and then, you know, you see Jeff Bezos, who in my opinion, doesn't seem like the best human being ordering everyone to come back to work, you know, in his head, he's basically going to be a trillionaire, you know, in his head and behind the scenes, he's investing billions, hundreds of billions maybe of dollars into replacing all of his workers that he looks at as swine with robots so that if this happens again, he doesn't even need to worry about it. And my concern is there's a vast amount of these jobs that probably aren't coming back at all. Um, if there's another wave and they shut the economy down again, then you have the S&P 500 going up while all this stuff is happening with, with the 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 amount of people that are going to go into poverty in America alone is going to significantly increase. The middle class is being destroyed. And my, my concern is I look at this and I go, I mean, is the dollar going to collapse at some, like I, my concern is looking at all of that and it doesn't seem like there's anybody in a centralized position of power that um, wants any of this to change at all. They're just hoping they can print so much money that even if the debt goes 120, 150% above GDP, that nobody's going to notice. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on all these uh, fiscal and monetary uh, policies that not just have played out um, because of coronavirus, but they've been playing out for an incredibly long period of time. You know, you've had Putin say that the dollar's day is coming. Uh, for a while, that the that the dollar needs to be removed as a as a global as the global currency, and just wondering your thoughts on all that. Well, I'm um, <laughs> as you were speaking, a, a blue jay just came in and sat on my <laughs> window, so, which I take is a very good sign. Is that, like, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't get so concerned about these issues like uh, what currency is going to take over or whether we're going to go back to the gold standard or whether we're on the oil standard. You know, for me, economy is people. There's no, there's no, there's no, the blue jay doesn't have an economy. I mean, you could say that feeding himself is his own personal economy, but there's no, you know, we are socially social animals. We're the only animals that really control ourselves through what we call an economic system. And that system is totally based on perception. So, you know, the idea of touching the Jaguar, this book is that, 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 that we create our reality through our perceptions. When you think about it, Jake, there's no United States, there's no China, there's no culture, there's no religion, there are no corporations, there's no economy, there's nothing like the, the, the human institutions except as we perceive them. And when enough people accept a perception or codify it into law, it has a huge impact on reality. And so, you know, we are basing our, 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 our economy. So the death economy is really, it's a global governmental social economic system. It's not just economics, because it's all people. And it's all based on this one perception of short-term profits. Now, indigenous cultures have never lived that way. You and I, we all come from indigenous cultures. If you look at the 250,000 or so years that we've been human beings, it's only been with a blink of an eye that we've had this very selfish short-term view. So I think the challenge here is how do we return to a long-term view? And we may have to go through some restructuring. Maybe the dollar will not be the predominant currency. Uh, who cares? I don't care. Uh, when do you think that that restructuring will happen? Just well, not, not until it gets so bad that things collapse or no, what? I think it was beginning. You know, I travel around the world. One of the benefits of having this book, this Confessions of the Economic Hitman book, I've published 10 books, but it's the one that threw me over the top. Five of those books are on indigenous people and shamanism. Right. And those the are new, the ones that I said I carried with me when I traveled. Oh, good. And, and then four are on global economics and intrigue. And then the 
the tenth one that is touching the jaguar, which is brings the two together. Mm. And basically, it takes the shamanic concept that we create reality through our perceptions, which is what I was taught as when I was trained as a shaman. But it's also the basis for psychotherapy. It's the basis for quantum physics. It's the basic for advertising. It's the basic for communicating. It's the basics for writing. It's the basics for art that we create reality by through through changing perceptions. We change reality by changing perceptions. And so, I, you know, as I've been traveling around the world before the virus, speaking at venues all over Russia, China, all, all over the world. Um, you know, I've been very, very encouraged to see how thousands of people show up at these events who all want to talk about exactly what we're talking about before the virus. The virus wasn't part of it. The idea, where are we going? What's happening? We know we've created a failed system. So so the, the, this touching the Jaguar idea gives you great hope because if you look at it as that there's a reality of the world has is filled with human and natural resources. And, if, and, and the, the shamanic people say, well, this is perception bridge that you got to cross. If you say that those, if your perception bridge says those resources should be used to maximize short-term profits, regardless of the social and environmental cost, it takes you to this reality of the death economy, which we're creating now, which we've been creating for these years. But if you take that same first reality of the world is filled with human and natural resources, and you cross a different bridge different perception that says, ah, these resources should be used in a way that benefits long-term survival, long-term benefits for humans and nature. It's renewable. You reach a different reality, which is the life economy. And <clears throat> what stands on that bridge, keeping you from moving from one perception short-term to the other perception long-term is a jaguar that says, oh, well, wait, you can't do it. You, you, you got to be fearful of this, but what does this mean? We all got to re- live in caves. What, 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 what does this mean to, to, to change that perception? We, we've been living with this perception. It's been taught in all of our schools. It's been drilled into us. Short-term benefits, uh, profits for corporations, short-term materialistic consumption for you and me, for us as people. I got to have, you know, that, that bumper sticker, <laughs> he who dies with the most toys wins. I mean, how sick is that? And but that's what we've been ingrained in. And this jaguar says you can't change. You touch that jaguar, and the jaguar says, "Oh, well, yeah." T- tells you, "Hey, you can change." The idea of long-term benefits is beautiful. So the carpenter, the carpenter goes out and says to his clients, "I want to build. <clears throat> I want to build with sustainable materials because I'm interested in the long-term future for my kids and my grandchildren, and your kids and your grandchildren." And the client says, ah, it's too expensive. I can't afford those sustainable products. And the, 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 the carpenter has already gone through this. He's touched his Jaguar and he helps his clients to touch the Jaguar. When they touch the Jaguar, the Jaguar says, ah, it's not a cost. It's an investment. You're investing. You may pay a little more, but you're investing in the future for you and your children and, and your grandchildren. And so, so then you build with sustainable products. You can do this throughout our culture, and it's been in the process of happening. I've seen this as I travel around the world, and again, I've seen it in the, in the, in the, the growth of B Corporation. My publisher is a B Corporation and a benefit corporation, both. Conscious capitalism, all these movements that have been coming up, 192 of the world's most powerful corporate executives you know, came together last August at the business roundtable and basically advocated for a life economy. They said we can no longer be driven by the goal of maximizing long-term profits only. We've got to look at how we help our employees and our customers and the, and the communities where we work. Will they do this? Well, you know, I've had a number of executives as I've been at these conferences. I speak at big conferences of executives as well as shamanic <laughs> communities together and, and rock festival. I, I'm lucky. I get to see all these different because of these two genres of books. And I've had so many executives tell me over a glass of wine or whatever, not during the formal meetings usually, but afterwards, hey, you know, I want my company to be greener. But I'm afraid that if, if I go too far and I, and I lose half a percentage of, of, uh, of market share or my stock price starts to go down, my top uh, investors will fire me. 
and they'll replace me with someone who only cares about stock prices or, or market share. So I ask you, you, you get an audience, John Perkins, go out there and tell all your listeners, all your readers, say, hey, and I do this in my most recent book, hey, write me a letter. And so I would suggest right now to all your listeners, Jake, pick a corporation that you want to see change, or one of the ones that's made this commitment, the 192 executives that's made this commitment, and write them emails or texts or tweets or however you want to do it, and get all your, all your circles to do it, and ask them to get all their circles to do it. And you say something like, you don't, you don't diss them, you don't, you know, you don't badmouth okay. them. You, you say something like, hey, I love your products, but I'm not going to buy them anymore until you pay your workers in India a fair living wage, or you clean up the pollution you cause, or whatever the, the issue is with whatever the company is. And these executives have told me, you know, I want to get all these messages. This is not all the executives, but this is quite a few. I want to get all these messages. And when I take these messages uh, to my top stockholders, I can tell them, hey, these are our customers. We've got to listen to them. Men, you got to understand, our market share may go down a little bit in the short term, but it's going to soar in the long term because we're going to be uh, we're going to go back to all these people who've signed these emails and they're going to be buying from us instead of our competitors. So I think that's the way that we we move forward with this is we all come together. You know, people like you and your podcast are playing an, an, an essential part in this. I'm on a lot of po podcasts. I was just on one the other day in Russia, and. Uh, you know, another one in Belgium and all over, and people all over are speaking about this. So if we can, if we, if we use this time to rally our forces and understand that every one of you listeners out there, every one of you, has power. Uh, you, you can, you, you do what if you're a carpenter, do as I said. If you're a writer, write books like I do about these things. Well, whatever you are, teacher, parent, you have amazing power to influence other people. And in this time of of social networking. Uh, you've got more power than ever. And it only takes a few minutes to sit down at your computer and, and hammer out that, that message to pick, pick Monsanto, Exxon, I don't care, Nike, you know, Walmart, whatever it is, pick a company and start a campaign. You've got big social networking circles and they get big, and they all reach out to many people. This is an ideal opportunity. And a lot of these executives want to get that information. They want to be pushed. I guarantee you. And I'll say this. There are some that are sociopaths and don't give a damn. Okay, but that was what I was about to say to you. They're, Bill, Bill Gates and a lot of – they're actual sociopaths that want to be – control the entire resources in GMO the entire world. You're talking about Monsanto. He actually wants to have all of Africa built on GMOs. So what do yeah. you do about – there are actual legitimate sociopaths – that own and operate the entire financial system that don't give a, like that's my that's that's where i'm they lie through their teeth on television jerome jerome powell goes on tv and says nothing's wrong with the economy it, i mean and it's like hello well, well jake first of all I, the head of monsanto doesn't want all of africa to be gmos what he wants to be is very powerful and very respected. He doesn't care whether it's GMOs or or, or widgets. Okay, that's <laughs> so, yeah, that's good he, and, and and the sociopaths are not driven by maximizing profits. They're driven by maximizing their egos. Hmm. And so, if we let them know that the way that they're going to get on the cover of Time Magazine, <laughs> Time Magazine's Person of the Year, is by being the greenest executive out there, by by being the leader in creating a life economy, they will do it. And that's where we got to go. So, yes, they're there. But we're not going to change that. There's what this, I don't know. There's estimates that one out of every 10 people is a sociopath. I don't know what the number is. Right. You know, that's the, there's nothing we can do about that. You know, there have always been people with screws loose and so forth. But what we can do is understand what drives them. And what drives these people is success. And if we, if we, identify, if we define success as maximizing short-term profits, then that's what they're going to do. And they're going to do everything in their power to do that. They're going to corrupt officials. And then today, you don't. It's legal to corrupt officials. You just pay for their campaigns. You know, right. you offer them lucrative consulting jobs if they lose or if they decide to leave after a few years. There's all kinds of ways to. And and so they're driven. They're, they're driven to do whatever it is. They'll corrupt officials. They'll destroy the, the environments upon which their long term depends. Uh, they'll exploit workers. They'll do everything like that because. 
they're driven. They're, they're told that success is that is that is that short term profit. What's the stock doing today, or, or what's the but the bottom line over the quarter, next quarterly report? But if we change that and say, look, the people who are going to make the big news shows, the people who are going to be on television, the people who are going to make them cover the cover the Times Person of the Year are going to be the ones that lead us down the path toward a life economy. The sociopaths will just be fighting so hard to make that happen. <laughs> Reverse psychology. All right. So um, let me ask you, um, when you foresee – you're talking a lot about um, long, long-term profits, which is really long. You're really what you're talking about is long-term solutions. You're talking about fixing up, cleaning up the environment, right? And we're talking about an economy that's based off of off of healthy production, not infinite money printing, right? So, as an economist, what do you? think that a monetary system should look like should we have fiat monetary systems in a federal reserve like this or should we have a monetary system that's backed by sus- something how, how do you if you were um president or you were head of the treasury or head of the imf or the world bank what solutions would you what what would you be proposing if you could make the decisions well i i don't claim to be an expert on that, frankly. So I'm not sure what I would propose. But what I what I would say is that the, the Federal Reserve System stinks. There's no question about it. A privately owned central bank uh, is not the way to go. And I think any thinking person can understand that. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a currency that's like the dollar that can, can create stability around the world. It could be beads, you know, like what bought Manhattan back then. And, and people have, for, for, for most of human history, as far as we know, people have had means of exchange. Once they, once they understood that it was a lot easier uh, for a hunter to get, to get something in his hands that he could then use, uh, to to pay to get get someone else to make him a dugout canoe, and he didn't have to actually carry tons of deer to the canoe maker to do that. It it, it, it became a way of making exchanges. We so do you that. think that the currency should be backed by something? Uh, well, yeah, of course, currencies have to be backed by trust, by some sort of thing. You have to know that when you when when the hunter gives gives the the canoe maker these beads. The canoe maker has to have trust that the deer is actually there, that he can go home tonight and that he can find the deer in his home. So, so some sort of an authority that backs that. Uh, it doesn't have to be something, I don't think it has to be oil, uh, which is what it is today. Uh, I don't think it has to be gold, which was not terribly successful at the time when you know the, the, the French called in all of our gold uh, reserves to, to match the money that we owed them back in 1971 and Nixon went off the gold standard. Uh, I, I don't think it has to be anything quite that simple. I think I think the idea of uh, of of uh, now the blockchain currencies that are coming into existence. I think this, I think this is an interesting f- a possibility for a future there. I don't think the current ones are are the right way to go exactly, but that's an exploration. And how, how are they backed? They're and the trust is that the blockchain can't be interfered with. That you can that you can trust the process. That if you that if you cut somebody's hair and you, and they pay you through this blockchain way, you can use that system to buy food. Uh, so we need some sort of a system that allows us to move forward. And again, I'm no expert on where that's going to go, but I think we're moving in the direction of using our our technology to allow that to happen. And in a way, I think this coronavirus has pushed us more and more in that direction because as far as I can see, not hardly anybody is using dollars these days. We're doing it all through PayPal or through credit cards over the Internet. There's almost there's very little exchange of money because we're not touching each other. We're not going into stores that way. There's some of it, but an awful lot of it's being done now more and more electronically. So I think, I think we're, that's, that's lighting the path for the future. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think some of the best things that have happened from the coronavirus has been, one, I think it's really made people wake up and kind of say, okay, enough's enough. We need to have some changes here. Um, Let me ask you, one of the things that, you know, having a 
large audience online. I, I get you know thousands of comments a week and emails and all that stuff. And and the thing that really breaks my heart is you know this is this has been really bad for people that aren't in the top 5% of the economy. And not only a lot of people losing their jobs, but then of the people that have retained work, they say that you know, the, the vast majority of people that have kept their job have had it, have, or their income streams have had them significantly reduced. And I, I see so many emails and messages of saying, what do I do? You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm on the verge of losing everything and, and I don't know what to do. And then, you know, we'll have certain types of companies, industries are seeing a lot going bankrupt and things like that. What advice do you have to somebody from that perspective of how to preserve your, fr- your freedoms and, and do obviously, of course, do something in a, in, a, in a meaningful way as well. What advice do you have to somebody that's maybe going through the ringer right now? They lost their job or they've had their income loss or their business is gone or they just, they're so confused and they don't know what to do and they're in debt. What advice do you have to, to, to a lot of people that are in that position? Well, they're angry or they should be angry, and be angry, my advice is. But think about how you want to direct that anger. I, you know, I teach workshops on, on, on this sort of thing and, and touching the Jaguar, and, and our emotions are so important. But what's most important is what we do with our emotions. We don't want to hide our anger. We don't want to try to suppress that. I'm angry as hell, Jake. I am so pissed off. At, <laughs> at the way the systems in this world work. And I used to get trampled by policemen on horses, you know, and, 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 sh- and tear gassed and, 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 it, and, and so on and so forth. And, and in many respects, I was, I was self-destructive with my anger. And I wasn't happy. Uh, now I'm still incredibly angry, but I channel my anger into writing books, into speaking out, into being on this show, into into looking at what can I do with this anger. So anger is just energy. Frustration is, is energy. Sadness is energy. Happiness is energy. What do we do with these things? How do we direct them? So I'd suggest every one of your listeners to really look at what can you do? And I can't tell you what you do. I can say as a writer, I choose to write stories that I think are fun and interesting, but they're all aimed at inspiring people to make to to participate in transforming a death economy into a life economy. That's all I write about. And I have a hell of a lot of fun doing it because I write stories, true stories that, 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 that show this up. I think, Jake, you're having a lot of fun doing this podcast. I suspect you've had to touch a lot of Jaguars to make it happen and keep it going. Uh, So where does this come from? So be angry, but look at how you want to direct that anger. And I think one of the ways I can suggest, I've already suggested, you know, getting, sending out social networking messages to corporations you want to change, but also we've got an election year coming up. And I don't for a minute believe that we're living in a democracy. Uh, This is a country that's controlled by, you know, money. There's no question about it. Nobody's running in this election that doesn't depend depend on very wealthy people and corporations to support them. But nonetheless, we got an election coming up and and we can have some influence over it. So get that message out there. By God, you know, yes, this country is going to be in deep, deep debt. There's no question. We're, we're in deep debt now. We're getting deeper and deeper, and unemployment's a problem. We've been through this before, the recession, uh, the Great Depression, uh, the World War. But always at times like this, one of the things that's helped us pull us out is heavy taxation on the rich and taxation on corporations. During World War II, corporations were taxed at over 50%, and the last number I saw today is under 8% on average, and a lot of them don't get taxed at all. A lot of them actually have negative taxes. They get paid. Amazon is one of them. Um, so insist that during this election, get out there and push for a candidate that, you, that, that will be receptive, to, hopefully receptive to this, and push and push the corporations and push and push and push and say, you know, we're only going to buy, buy from corporations that pay their fair share of taxes. And the taxes then go to creating projects that employ people in a life economy. We've got so much that needs to be done in this country. You know, 
think about this. You know, the, we've 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 lost more people in the last uh, six months, less than six months, to coronavirus than we did during the Vietnam and Korean wars combined. You know, we uh, we we spend as much money on on, na on on national defense as the next 10 countries combined. And yet we had the hardest hit by the coronavirus. What the hell does that tell you? It tells you that we ought to be spending an awful lot more money on our healthcare systems and on helping people be, make sure that everybody gets healthcare, make sure that everybody has access to it. I mean, there's so many things that we can do in this direction, but we, the people, have to push it. So, I, uh, you know, it, uh, this has been kind of general, but so specifically, I would say to each and every one of your listeners out there, take a good look at what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Let, let this coronavirus be a time when you can sit back and say, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? What will bring me the greatest satisfaction, the greatest happiness? And how do I tie that in with a much larger picture with how, helping other people? Maybe it's only one other person. Or maybe it's my family, maybe it's the whole world, but we always feel better when we're doing what we love to do. For me, it's writing. I love to write. How do I tie that in with a bigger audience, uh, changing the, the death economy to a life economy? And every one of you can look at that. How do you, because it gives us greater satisfaction to do things that help somebody else, whether it's one person or a large group. What's kept me from doing that? What voices have told me, oh, oh, you can't write. Your English teacher in college said you were a lousy writer, which mine did. You can't write. <laughs> and I published a lot more books than he ever did. <laughs> <laughs> you can't write. And uh, you can't, you know, you can't convince your customers to use sustainable materials and pay a little more money. And turn that around. Look at how do you alter that perception? Oh, my, 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 high, my college English teacher said Bob Dylan was a lousy writer, too. He won the Nobel Prize in Literature. <laughs> that changes that perception. And then what do you do to take action every day? And incidentally, there's a whole process in Touching the Jaguar. People pre-order the book. They'll, they'll, they'll get a workbook that, to, to, soon that, that tells them what uh, that takes them through this process simply. But we can go through this process. Each and every one of your listeners is what can each one of them do? And if you're feeling angry, pissed off, frustrated, sad, whatever it is you're feeling, Feel it and use that energy to move us forward into something that our children and grandchildren will look back and say, thank God those people went through that difficult, difficult time of losing their jobs. And a lot of them lost their lives and they, they suffered. And thank God they went through it and came out with something that's really helping us, their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. We can make that happen, Jake. It's nice, to see, it's nice to see the emotion. So in Napoleon Hill's book, Thinking Grow Rich, he talks about um, <clears throat> using dissatisfaction for inspiration. And I recently interviewed Mark Cuban, and he was saying, look, at this point, most people don't have anything to lose. They literally have not, they can't lose any more than they've already lost. And so I think that that's an important rallying cry is to, harness that dissatisfaction and to harness that that anger and to harness those types of of emotions especially in an environment where there really is nothing really is nothing else most people can't lose too much more than they already are and i feel like when enough people get to that it's it, when enough people get to that ledge where they get pushed in the corner long enough that can be the thing that finally, as you said, you stop ignoring those voices in your head that tell you you're too stupid to start that business or you can't become successful at this thing or this thing and you've always wanted to do this, but you've got all these voices in your head that you've identified with that are really just social construct and we're breaking out of all of those things and I, and I, and I hope that uh, ultimately that's you as a listener, that's the, that's the the shift that occurs is you finally just say, well, what do I have to lose anymore? And, and out of that emotion, that's how the new companies, whether it's a, whether it's a, a environmental company or it's a, or it's a, 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 a banking company or a widget or a tech, it doesn't matter what it is, but those are the things that become these huge corporations that hopefully someone that's that's conscious that's running them and and they're used for good and i hope that that's where we're going yeah i, well, I me too i mean i think that 
I think we are headed in that direction, but enough of us, as I said before, uh, reality is molded by perceptions. And when enough people accept the perception or codified into law, it has a huge impact on reality. So at this point, what we, what's important is to convince enough people out there that yes, we can create a life economy, but you and I and all of your listeners have to make it happen. You know, I'm, I'm in, I've always, incidentally, uh, Napoleon Hill, I, I read him many, 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 many years ago. He had a big influence on me getting out of the economic hitman business and, and moving into uh, doing what I do today <laughs> in a strange sort of way. But um, I, I'm struck by the story of how at the end of his um, term as president, well, not the end of his term, he died in office, but as, as, as World War II was, was winding down, uh, President uh, Roosevelt met with a number of union leaders uh, from the auto industry. And as they were leaving the Oval Office, he was shaking their hands and he was saying to them, you know, I think you, you got from this meeting that I'm on your side. I want to help you. And now I'm going to ask you to go out there and tell all your rank and file to force me to do what I want to do because I've got to be pushed to do it because the American public is not just going to accept it. If I say it, it's got to put, be pushed from the, from, from, from the rank and file. And, and that's exactly what many of these corporate executives are telling me today. We, the, the ones that want to do good, and then there's the sociopaths, that we can still force them to do good. But we've got to do it through we, the consumers, we, the employees, we, the investors, whatever we're, we're our role, to keep, to keep pushing that thing. And for, you know, I, I have a good friend who is a, a waitress, uh, and has lost her job. And in Seattle, I live near Seattle. The, the, the estimate is that more than half the restaurants in Seattle will never reopen, and probably a lot more. And, and she's like, she was devastated. Like I, I, and she loves food. And she particularly loves uh, uh, vet, 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 organic, vegetarian type of food. And uh, so she was devastated. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And um, so I get her to thinking about this. How, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? What do you, how do you touch that Jaguar? And, and she's now developing a business of selling food, uh, organic, uh, vegetarian type food online. You know, and so we've got these local restaurants that are doing it. You can go and order and then pick it up. But she's, she's, trying to set, she's in the process of setting up a, na a nationwide system of other people that think like her that can come together. Um, kind of like the B and B idea, and not exactly, but the whole idea that you would have that you'd have a, a conglomerate of people around the country that all are interested in, in making these foods in their homes, uh, where where licenses permit that, and I think the licenses are going to get looser in that way, and and then can 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 you know people can in those local areas can order the food and it'll be and and they'll be delivered to their homes. Uh, but but a whole kind of a national network where everybody's their own entrepreneur. But there's a there's a there's a process as far as getting paid, as far as you know the, the whole financial that creating sort of a almost a Bitcoin system within this small field. And I'm not sure where it's all going to go. But she's really excited now. She's you know she's she's enjoying now this this life of isolation, which is giving her time to really do this and not be isolated, but reach out to people around the country. And she's meeting all these people around the country that have very similar interests to hers. So uh, a month ago, she was depressed. I don't know. I think she was almost suicidal. She was really depressed. Now she's really excited. And, you know, she's following her heart and she's doing something that's extremely constructive for her and for the life economy. She's essentially promoting a life economy. That's just one of the example. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's kind of what I was saying there is, is my, my, everyone is looking for, tell me what business to do and tell me to how to do it and tell me exactly the strategy that I need to make more money or get more freedom or find more meaning or tell me what I need to invest in. And they're always looking for, tell me exactly what to do. And I think that what really needs to happen is it that kind of goes back to a good example of, of Mark Cuban saying, what else do you have to lose? And if you channel your depression or your, or your anger or your confusion into something that you're excited about, that's the shift, right? Because then the other thing I always say is, so what's the number one cause of, of illness? It's stress-related. And so what, what type of shifts will we have in the world 
if people finally said, I don't have much more to lose, and they went and worked on a, on a business, a project, a creative, an entrepreneurial thing, whatever it was that they were passionate about. That in and of itself, long term, if a lot of people finally had the courage to say, you know what, screw it, I'm going to go for it, that type of shift in the emotional well-being of people would significantly drop stress, stress rates. It would significantly affect the, the health and well-being of, of, of human beings and, and, the, and the general population. And that in and of itself would make people be a lot kinder, of course. Um, that in and of itself, like that's what I envision that can happen. And so I love that you shared that, that example. And, and for those listening, I hope this is a rallying cry to finally say, all right, I'm going to go out there and, and start it. Yeah. And yeah, I don't have anything to lose and I've got everything to gain. This is a great opportunity to gain. You know, when I wrote this, this book, uh, touching the Jaguar it, and, the, and the subtitle is transforming fear into action to uh, change your life and world. To change your life in the world, yes, and that's exactly it. And 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 I had no idea there was going to be a coronavirus, but I did know that we were experiencing so many once in one hundred year events every year or so, hurricanes and earthquakes and so on. That the that the Earth is speaking to us, and and now the coronavirus has taken this global. Those were all we looked at those as local events in the past. This is a global event, and so the book is written with the idea that, again telling stories that I think are fun to read, but in the end is providing this, this process that everybody can do for 10 minutes a day or a little less than 10 minutes. And it doesn't have to be every day. You can do it once a week. But where you really go into looking for you as an individual, whatever you are, a parent, a, a plumber, a, a teacher, a, a podcast a host, a, whatever, uh, and, and, and really go into this. Like, 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 and that's exactly what this, this woman who was a, a waitress and now is, is an amazing entrepreneur <laughs> is in the process of becoming that anyway, is going through that every person out there should look at this as a time. And you, you say, like, well, damn, I can't, I can't self-isolate any longer. Not another day. Forget about another month or two months or 18 months is somebody saying out there, I can't do it. Well, you touch that Jaguar and the Jaguar says, oh, well, but there's a lot you can do while you're doing this. Uh, what do you really want to do with your rest of your life? And now start doing it. Start doing it. Start really looking at that. And so the, this, you know, I wrote this whole this book with the idea of helping people exa- exactly address that issue, not having any idea that this opportunity, yes, it's a challenge, it's a catastrophe, a lot of people are suffering, I'm, I'm not downplaying any of that. And for those of us who are in a position to be, be healthy enough to really look at this as an opportunity, let's do it and, and let's move forward, each of us individually taking a separate path. But we, together we head for the same destination, which is creating a better world. 